Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. My name is Eric Sebastian. I'm our campus pastor uh, over at our McKinney campus and our lead grow pastor here for Hope Fellowship. And I want to welcome you to all of our campuses, Prosper Campus, uh, Frisco West, McKinney, our home, my home campus. Good to see everybody. Everybody here at Frisco East. Good to see everybody watching online. We're glad you're here for week two of our series that we're in, Yahweh. Uh, where we are studying the names of God, characteristics of God, attributes of God. And uh, last week, Pastor John kicked off this series with us and introduced us to I am. And God and Moses are having this conversation in Exodus. And Moses says, well, who should I tell them has sent me? And, Moses, and God says, tell them that I am has sent you. And they had this great conversation. And John kind of pulled five truths out for us. He said, that, you know, we reminded us that God is, number one, in need of nothing, but then number two, he wants a relationship with us. And then he reminded us that God is with us, that God is unchanging, and that God is a God who keeps his promises. And so next week, we're gonna be continuing in the Yahweh series. We're gonna be talking about uh, the God who provides. The week after that, week four, we're gonna talk about the God who heals. And then in the final week of this series, we're talking about the God who saves. And that'll take us right up to Palm Sunday. And then the weekend after that will be Easter Sunday, Easter weekend, resurrection weekend. And so this series is gonna take us right up to Easter. We're super excited about it. And and so for today though, we're in week two and we're talking about El Roi, the God who sees. So everybody here at East, across our campuses, watching online, just say that name of God together. Say El Roi. There we go. We get this name from a passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 16. God is having this conversation with this Egyptian uh, servant girl named Hagar. And she says this at the, towards the end of this chapter in 16, she says, it says, thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So she's seeing God, which leads us to a fascinating question. Have you ever allowed yourself just to wander down the rabbit trail for any length of time to say like, what does God actually look like? Like, have you ever thought this before? Have you ever thought like God in heaven, God on his throne, like what does he look like? Like, what's his face look like? Like, does he have hair? Is it long? Is it lush? You know, what's he look like? Like, who is God and what, what does he look like? Hagar is one of only nine people recorded in scripture that has had multiple visits from the Lord here in scripture. I mean, she, she's one of very few people recorded in the Bible that actually can say, this is what the Lord looks like. She has an entire conversation with him that we're gonna jump into here in a minute in Genesis chapter 16. But for the rest of us, on the other hand, it leaves us kind of wondering the question, okay, well, what does God look like? And that's actually why we're in this series because we're trying to find out what, what does God look like? Okay, he's a God who provides. Okay, he looks like a God who heals. He looks like a God who saves. Today, a God who sees. These are characteristics. These, this is what God looks like. And so, you know, maybe you know, we're trying to paint this picture so that hopefully we can follow God more closely. Or, or maybe you're here, maybe you're at one of our campuses or watching and you're just trying to find out what God looks like because you're, you're trying to decide like if, you're even, if he's even worth following or not. Either way, kind of wherever you see yourself, we're painting this picture of what God looks like because we don't really know in totality exactly what God looks like, who he is in his fullness. We don't know what he looks like. Well, most of us don't, but I did, I did come across this story this last week of this uh, kindergarten teacher and she uh, had students in her room. They were coloring pictures in class. And so she was just kind of walking around the room and, and kind of seeing, inspecting what all the kids were doing. And she saw this one little girl in particular who was just coloring like, like just ferociously on her picture. And so she stooped down and she asked her, she said, hey, Sweetie, what what are you drawing? What picture are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And the teacher said, oh, well, sweetheart, that's that's cute, but nobody really knows what God looks like. And she said, well, teacher, they're gonna know here in a minute. (laughs) I wish it was that easy for us. I wish we could just get the pen and paper out. It's like, whatever we want God to look like, this is what he looks like. You know, like this is who God is. This is what he looks like. But for us, the truth is we need help. We need help figuring out what God looks like because right when we start to get a handle on things, aren't we start to get a handle on figuring out exactly how God is supposed to look? We're drawing him to our exact specifications. He starts to look differently to us. Why is this? Because for you and for me, for all of us, we know that God can be confusing at times. 
to us. God can be unpredictable at times with us. God can be like Texas weather right now to us. Like, you're like, I, I'm, I'm leaving for work. I've got my rain jacket. I've got a winter coat. I've got a pair of shorts and I've got sunscreen. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know what elements I'm gonna be facing today. It, it, we can get confused at times with God. We have this proclivity just to get our pens, to get our paper out and just start to go to work, drawing our version of who God is and what God looks like. And so because of that, it starts to distort our view of who God is in reality because God doesn't always do what we're drawing him to do. He doesn't always meet our needs the way that we're needing him to meet our needs. And so the picture that we have of God, it, 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 it doesn't align always with who God is in reality. John even asked a question last weekend, at this, at the, at, right at the jump of this series that we're in. And he was talking about Yahweh and I am and this God who wants a relationship with us and is unchanging. And right in the middle of the message, I mean, you, you might've even missed it, but he asked a, a question, he's kind of in passing. He said, have you ever felt like Jesus was asleep? And I remember being on the front row at McKinney last weekend. I was taking notes and John asked this question. And before I even could even think about it, I said, yes. And it almost like it startled me. Like I didn't appreciate the amount of honesty that I was giving myself in that moment. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves here today, we would answer yes to that question. Have you ever felt like Jesus was asleep? Yes, at times. Why? Because a lot of the time for us, we know that the things that we see can distort how we see God. And maybe in your world, you've, started to, you've seen pain in your life. And so you see pain and all of a sudden now your view of God is God is cruel. He's harsh. Why would he be dealing with you this way? Or maybe in your circumstance in your life, you start to see trouble. You start to see trials. And now all of a sudden, because of these trials, your view of God is God is angry with me. God, what have I done to incur your wrath on my life in this season? Like whatever I've done, I'll, I will fix it. I'll change. I'll read. I'll course correct. Why are you angry with me? Or, or maybe it's the opposite of that. Maybe we start to, in our picture of God, we start to see life. And we start to see color. And now we start to see happiness. And now our view of God is that God is good. He's this good God. And so we wrestle with these questions of how do I get an accurate view of who God is? What, what does God really look like? Or the question for us just to, to dive into today is how do you see God for who he truly is? And we get a glimpse into who God truly is in Genesis chapter 16 when Hagar gives him this name that you are El Roi, the God who sees. And it starts off, we're gonna start at the very beginning of the chapter in, in verse one. And it says, now Sarai... Abram's wife, I'll just take a quick, like Zach Morris timeout real quick, and we're gonna do something. It says Sarai and Abram. The rest of this passage that we're gonna read talks about Sarai and Abram. We probably know them more as Sarah and Abraham. A couple of chapters later, God changes their name. So just for the sake of continuity today, we're gonna go in and change their name for them. So Sarah and Abraham. And Sarah had not been able to bear children for Abraham. Just one chapter earlier, in chapter 15, several years earlier, to date, God and Abraham had had this conversation and Abraham and Sarah are in the latter stages of their life. They have no kids. Sarah is barren. They've kind of given up the idea of having kids and all of a sudden God just like throws a, a zinger in here and he says, you're gonna have kids. And he tells Abraham in chapter 15, he says, look up, you're gonna have more descendants than stars in the sky. So Abraham has gotten this covenant, this promise from God. And now it's been nearly 10 years later no children, no son, no descendants outnumbering the stars and the sky. And they're getting a little anxious here in scripture. They're getting a little, like they're having to wait. And we don't like to wait. I mean, most of us, we don't like to be on hold for five minutes with an insurance company. You know what I'm saying? They're waiting for almost 10 years on a promise from God. And also this promise came to Abraham. He had to tell this promise to Sarah. She didn't hear it on her own. So you gotta be thinking after several years now of waiting, Sarah's gotta be thinking like, Abraham, I'm not so sure you actually heard from God. Or maybe you think you heard, but it could have just been like some bad falafel from the night before. Like you, if something's not, your diet is off. Something's not right, right? And, and, and so they're having this conversation. And, and then it says that she has an Egyptian servant though named Hagar. And so Sarah said to Abraham, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. 
And Abraham agreed with Sarah's proposal. Can I just uh, make a quick public service announcement here that um, Hope Fellowship does not condone this sort of a response to dealing with marital issues. Um, I know I'm not John, but I feel like I can speak on authority here for him in that regard. Uh, I, this reads weird. Instead of us going into all the reasons why this was normal, just take it from me that in biblical history, not only was this practice legal, but it was actually kind of common to do this. And so the thing for us is not to take away that part of how they responded, but to take away this part of how Sarah responds because how she responds is she does what we do. She says, well, God just needs a little bit of help and I'm just the person to do it. And she says, God, you're taking too long. Allow me to intervene. Have you ever felt like God just needed a little bit of help? <laughs> We've all felt like, God, if you would just let me do it, like we would, we would avoid this whole pain cycle altogether. We don't even need to go through that. That's not even important. God, if you would just let me get a hold of, of my boss just for a minute, man, we would, we would work a lot of things out. I could sort them out pretty quickly. God, if I could just, just give me five minutes with my spouse, let me just change a couple of things about their personality and who they are innately and everything about them. It won't take me very long. Hey, just let me redirect. Like, God, if you would just give us, give us one season to coach the Cowboys, like we, we could do something about this, you know? Like, God, throw us a bone here. We would bring a ring back to Dallas. Like, we, we, we wanna intervene, we wanna interfere. We like to meddle in what God is doing. And this is where Sarah's at. She's, she's meddling, they're seeing, and what they're seeing is distorting what their view of God is. What they are seeing is not lining up with what God has said. It doesn't make sense. It's not matching up. And so they do what we do and they interfere. They start to, they start to help God. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abraham as a wife. So Abraham had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarah with contempt. So you see what's happening here. Hagar becomes pregnant. Sarah becomes jealous. Hagar can feel this baby moving and kicking inside of her. And Sarah is constantly reminded that she can't have kids. And now after nearly 10 long years of waiting on this promise from God, Hagar, not Sarah, is the one that will see it come to fruition. And Sarah is just feeling ashamed and overwhelmed because she feels broken. And she's gotta be, I mean, she has to be thinking things like, God, why would you make Abraham a promise like this when you know I can't have a baby? I mean, there's no way she's not thinking things like, God, why would you parade me around in my shame for everybody to see? And, and we know these feelings because we ask God things all the time. We say, God, if you say that you love me, then why would you allow this to happen to me? God, how much longer do I have to endure in this situation? And we begin, just like Sarah, to see God differently than who he really is. And in Sarah's case, her shame leads her to blame. It says in verse five, Sarah said to Abraham, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. And the Lord will show who is wrong, you or me. This is like some real like, Adam and Eve and the apple kind of a stuff going on here. Like, this is Sarah's plan. Abraham doesn't argue with the plan. He actually is complicit with the plan. And now that the plan has happened, the plan is all Abraham's fault. I, like, if we could just like lean our ear to the tent, I, 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 this conversation sounds something like, Abraham, you know I can't have kids. And so I have a servant, Hagar. You're gonna have a baby with her. And Abraham probably said something to her like, Baby, if that's what you need me to do, I'll do it. <laughs> and so Abraham runs off with Hagar and he says, we're gonna have a baby. And he has a baby with Hagar. And then he comes back and he says, Sarah, guess what? Hagar and I are having a baby. To which Sarah responds, I cannot believe you would go off and have a baby with Hagar. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? It's hard to believe that there are any issues in this family. And if you're looking for what like the picture perfect family of, like a, the prime candidate for re-engage, like we found them. Genesis chapter 16. It says, Abraham replied, look, she is your servant. Do with her as you see fit. He said, this is not my problem. You deal with it. Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. And the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from? Question one. Where are you going? Question two. 
She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. Sarah made life, uh, Hagar's life so miserable that she's running away. And literally when the, the Bible says treated her so harshly, that word translates to oppressed. She was oppressing her to such an end that she said, I'd rather be anywhere than right here. And in her despair, in her sorrow, pregnant and all alone, in her wondering, for the first time recorded in the Bible, God calls somebody by name. He says, Hagar. Where are you coming from? Where are you going? What are you doing? But Hagar's only able to answer this first question. Where have I come from? I'm running. I, I can't be here any longer. And we, man, we know that feeling, don't we? At every campus, watching online, here at East, we can identify with that kind of pain, every single one of us. When the pain is so real, like it's so evident in your life, you're like, I just gotta, I've gotta get away from it. I've gotta retreat just for a second. I mean, perhaps it's the pain of feeling let down yet again by your spouse. And you're like, I just, I can't deal with this right now. I've, I've gotta just, I've gotta retreat for a second. Or maybe, you're, maybe it's, it's with your parents. Maybe it's in your disappointment as you find out that the mom or dad that you've known your entire life have been living a lie and there's somebody else entirely. And you're like, wait, hold on. And, and your whole world is crumbling and, and, and you're full of questions. How do you see God in those moments? What's your view of God? Is he angry? Is he disappointed? Is he just non-existent? Have you ever felt like in your life that Jesus was asleep, especially when you needed him the most? When he has maybe once again left you feeling so confused and you're stuck with questions of, God, why? It was 2016 and my wife uh, started having some pretty severe heart palpitations and that eventually led us to a doctor, which eventually led us to multiple tests, which all confirmed this um, very scary diagnosis of a potentially life-threatening, lifelong heart condition. And so after several visits here locally, we were flown up to the Mayo Clinic uh, in Minnesota where a specialist was to gonna, gonna go into her heart and kind of uh, investigate the severity of everything going on and put a pacemaker in. We were told that she's gonna be on medications for the rest of her life and that more than likely this was genetic and it had been passed down to our two kids as well. And so very scary for our family. And it was the majority of the year in 2016 we were walking through this. And so we were blown away um, when after the procedure and, and once she was awake and, and the heart specialist came into our room and said, listen, I've investigated, I've been in thousands of hearts. And what we've seen on your heart on scans is not in your heart any longer. There's no need for a pacemaker. There's no need for medications. There's no condition that you could have passed down to your kids. Like your heart is healed completely. Yeah, it was a very, it, you talk about, you talk about El Roe, the God who sees, and we were feeling so seen in that moment, feeling so seen in that hospital room that God had given us this miracle story. And it was November 8th, 2016. And this date became sacred for myself and my wife and for our family. I mean, November 8th, 2016 was a day that God brought healing and he brought life to our family. And you just fast forward that clock, just two years, 2018. And we found out that now we're expecting our third child and, and his due date was none other than November 8th, 2018. I mean, we were, in, we were in awe of the significance of that date, of the significance of that healing and now being the due date of our son that we had been praying for. I mean, it, it felt so special. It felt so ordained. Really, it was meant to be. And it, without warning, with every ultrasound being one of, of a completely healthy baby, we were blindsided when in my wife's second trimester, we went in for an appointment and they could not find a heartbeat on her son. And you talk about pain and you talk about heartache and you talk about just devastation. And now all of a sudden this date, November 8th, has taken on a completely different meaning that we, we, want, we want no part of. And we've got all, these, all the questions, all the God, why questions and grieving. 
So much so to where even almost two years later, John can ask a routine question in the middle of his message. And he can say something like, have you ever felt like Jesus was asleep? And before you even realize it, you can go, well, yes. And it startles you because that pain is still very much alive. This is the pain that, this is this type of pain that Hagar is dealing with. Isolated, alone, wandering, in her pain, in her despair, in her misery, wondering, does anybody even see me? And you, we've felt this way. You, you've felt this way before. Some of you maybe are feeling this way even right now. We know this pain, and God can look so confusing for us in seasons like this if we forget one very important thing about God. That even when we can't see God, God never stops seeing us. He is El Roi. He is the God who sees. Listen, in verse nine, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. And you are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. And thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are El Roi, the God who sees me. And she said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? God saw Hagar right in the middle of her despair. When those around her had turned on her and she was completely alone, God says, I still see you. He comforted her, promised her a son, told her that he would give her more descendants than stars in the sky. I mean, this very similar promise that he gave Abraham. And he says, I hear you in your pain. And God went from being this El Roi, this God who sees all things and is over all things, to now he is this El Roi. He's this God who sees you very specifically in every detail and every fabric and every part, every nook and cranny of your life. He's not just overseeing all things in the world and all this. No, now he's seeing you and he's in the details. It's no longer a God who loved the world. Now he's very personally the God who loves you. And can I tell you in moments like this, in moments of pain and in moments of despair and in moments where we're left going, the God that I'm sensing and who God really is are not adding up. In those moments, it's not really how we see God that makes the biggest difference for us. No, see, what makes the biggest difference for us, what makes all the difference for us is the reality of knowing that it's how God sees us and the fact that God is seeing us and that God has been and will continue to see us. He sees you. Can I just encourage you this morning in the circumstances that you're in, God sees you right now, right in whatever you're in. He sees it. He sees you in your loneliness. He sees you in your anxiety. He sees you in the midst of your marital or your family situation. He is aware, acutely aware of what you are going through because he is El Roi, the God who sees you and me. And he never stops seeing us. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Have you ever felt like Jesus was asleep? How do you see God in those moments? How do you see God in those seasons? You see God as someone who is seeing after you. Because he is the God who is always seeing you and seeing after us. He sees you, he hears you, he comforts you, he cares for you, and he promises to never leave you. But did you notice that in verse nine, God doesn't rescue Hagar from her circumstance. He, he, he doesn't pull her out of her situation. And this is where we get confused because at times God sends her back to Sarah. He sends her back to Abraham instead of giving her a new home or a new path or a new life. God doesn't answer Hagar according to the way we think that she ought to be answered. And if we were drawing here, if we had the pen and paper, we would draw Hagar's conclusion completely differently. We draw her a new pathway or a new storyline. And because of that, it causes us to see God differently than who he really is because it feels like, well, the story's not matching up. It doesn't make sense because if, clearly if God is seeing her and is caring for her, then he wouldn't send her back to Sarah. He wouldn't send her back to Abraham. 
Because we think the same thing. We say, well, God, clearly you don't see me or clearly you're not caring for me because, because you're not answering, you're not, you're not coming through in this specific way. You're not meeting my need in this certain area the way that I need you to. It, it makes us feel like God is asleep at times yet again. But notice in this same passage, Hagar's joy doesn't come from the removal of her circumstance because she's not removed from her circumstance. Hagar's joy and our joy should come from the fact that God sees her in her circumstance. And she has gone from feeling completely abandoned and completely alone to now the God who sees is seeing her and he's with her. And, and he answers her second question for her. Where are you going? I've got a plan now. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a pathway laid out for you. I see you, I hear you, and I am with you always. And this is the promise that we have from God. This is what we get to hold on to, that God is not just a God who sees, but he's a God who sees us right where you are. It doesn't mean he always promises to fix everything, to fix your boss or to fix your husband or to fix your wife or to fix your kids or to fix your parents, but he does promise to see us and in seeing for us, care for us and in caring for us, comforting us and in comforting us, letting us know that we are never alone. He is with us because when God sees you, you are never alone. You're never alone. It, 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 it's taken me a long time to, and my wife and I to learn this lesson, to see that God is still good even in grief and even in sorrow. That he's still faithful even though we'd felt let down and, and we'd felt hurt by the loss of our son. You know, that healing didn't come by way of us having another child. We, we didn't get removal from the circumstance. I mean, if I was drawing God, if I was drawing this season, I would have drawn it completely differently. I've gotta be honest. I mean, my pen and my paper would have looked completely differently, but it's, it's forced us to start to see God differently and then to come face to face with the reality that in our despair and in our grief and in our loss, that God is still El Roi, a God who is seeing us a God who is comforting us, a God who is always with us. The situation didn't change, the, the grief didn't just evaporate, but we've gotten a firsthand experience these last two years, and I feel like I'm on the front row of a master class for the last two years of learning that the God who sees is also the God who sees me. And can I just tell you that the God who sees today is also the God that sees you. We, I heard a song that we sang today in worship actually for the very first time about a, I mean, just a couple of days after we lost our son. And every time I'd put the song on in my car, I was like, it's a glutton for punishment, I guess. Every time I'd listen to it, I would just cry and cry. And it was just in this crazy tension in the aftermath of like, God, I, I trust you, but I also do not understand you. Many of you guys know what that feels like. And it was in this song, the, 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 during the time of this song, we were singing it and it says, you know, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. And, and my wife and I, during that same time, we were just drawing a lot of comfort, getting, finding great comfort in the book of Romans. And specifically in Romans chapter eight, verse 38, it says, and I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And just a couple of weeks after all this, we sang this song in church on a Sunday, but for the first time we did something different. We had never done this at Hope. And right before it got to that part that says, not for a minute, the Bible verse came on the screens and it was just meant for us just to read and reflect and kind of just ponder on it. And the verse was Romans eight thirty eight, And I am convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And in that Sunday, I mean, you might've even been at church that Sunday and you, you might've even read that verse and thought, well, that, that's, that's good, that's really good. That's encouraging. You might've had your eyes closed and you completely missed it. But can I tell you from my wife and I, that Sunday specifically on the front row at the McKinney campus, it, it was just yet another reminder. It was one of the many moments of the past two years where God said, I'm not just a God who sees. No, 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 I see you. And it was one of these calling us by name kind of a moments, I see you. 
And in processing grief and in the confusion with my wife and I both, now we see November 8th completely differently. Now it's this day of tension, but it's also a day that shows we've been seen by God, the God who gives and takes away. But no matter what, blessed be your name. The God who sees. Can I just tell you this morning that in your joy, God sees you. In your pain, God sees you. And everything in the middle of that, God, he's seeing you in the good, the bad, and the confusion of it all. He sees you and he never stops seeing you. And just because you're in pain now, it doesn't mean that you're going to stay there always and it doesn't mean that you've always been there. And it's in those times of pain where we have to remember, we remind ourselves the times where we've been seen by God and remind ourselves that even in this moment, God is still seeing us. Because it's in those times and it's in those encounters that serve as reminders for us And we find ourselves in a place or you find yourself in a season where you're saying, God, are you asleep? God, you're not lining up here. God, do you see me in this moment? The answer for us is he has seen you. He is seeing you even now and he will see you through. And that's a promise that we have from El Roe, the God who sees. David says, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid because you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. When you're in your darkest valley, how do you see God? When you're in the mountaintop experience, how do you see God? Would you, in in both of those seasons and in everything in between, would you see God as a God who is always seeing you? The band's gonna come out at every campus. We're we're gonna sing a song, hopefully just kind of drives this point home for us. I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna give you six words, six words to pray before the band sings. But it's gonna be a response to a question. This is a question I have for every single one of us watching online here at East, watching at every campus. In your situation, in your story, in your life, if God promised to see you, if God promised to guide you, if God promised to bring you joy, and he promised to never leave you, would you still follow him? Let me take a couple seconds here and the team's gonna come out and maybe on your own, just 15, 20 seconds, that you would uh, would maybe offer up a prayer to God this morning and you would just say very simply, God, I know you see me. Remind yourself of that this morning.